So I will try to to address a question that Lorenz Avella um, asked this morning, which is what is the most general way to, to encode quantum information? Um, so I will come to the same conclusion as she had, which is that um, it's not. Can you check the microphone's on? It's the smaller one. This one is on? Uh, this one, all right. Okay. It's on? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just repeat. I will uh, try to address the question that Lorenz Saviola asked this morning, which is uh, what is the most general way to uh, encode quantum information? Uh, so I will come to the same conclusion that she, uh, she came to, which is that it is indeed those uh, subsystems. But in the, in the way, I will explain why, why it should be so. And uh, so, she mentioned those algebras, and indeed, those, uh, this subsystem structure comes from the structure of these algebras. And I will explain this in the second part of my talk that you can see up here. In the first part, I will explain where those algebras come from. And at the end, I will give some example there. So, uh, first, I want to do everything uh, as uh, David mentioned from the Eisenberg picture. That is, I will not consider the evolution of states, but the evolution of observable. So let me just uh, remind you how this works, uh, which is not totally familiar, maybe, in the stochastic picture. So if we have a general channel with its um, cross tri operators, so the idea is that what really matters are not the states, but expectation values of observables. So with these guys, um, if A happens to be a projector, these guys are probabilities, and that's what we use to make predictions. Um, so here I just expand the channel in terms of its uh, error operators. Now we can use the cyclicity of the trace to put it over there, and linearity of the trace to put the sum inside. And so now this is another completely positive map which now is acting on the, on the observables themselves. Uh, the difference with the initial one is that the dagger went from the right to the left. So this is a dual channel that um, David was talking about. Physically, it's not, no, it is uh, describing the evolution of observables instead of states. So it does describe the Eisenberg picture. Uh, it is still completely positive, but instead of being trace preserving, it is no unital. So it is not trace preserving, but it does preserve the, the identity. Uh, one thing to, to realize is that if you compose two of those channels and you take the dual of the composition, so this means that first we do E and then we do F in time. But because uh, dual um, emission or the conjugation reverts the order, in a sense, these channels go back in time. They, uh, they take future observables to past observables. All right, so I will use this picture and what I want to do is to characterize the observables which are conserved by this channel, which means they are fixed by the channel. So I will begin with uh, the simplest quantum observables, which is a projector. So it's a two-level a two observable or a proposition in the quantum system. So what I want is to, uh, to know whether P is fixed by the channel. So I interpret this as saying that this property represented by P is preserved by the evolution. Um, so if this is true, then I can take the, the projector on the orthogonal subspace and the product of um, the orthogonal projector and the projector is zero. So uh, this implies this because I just multiply on the left and the right by the orthogonal projector and I get zero on the right. The point of this is that this gets me a, a sum of operators which is equal to zero, but each of them is a positive operator. And when a sum of positive operators is zero, then each of them uh, independently is zero. Now I can rewrite, so each of these guys are zero. I just wrote it, rewrote it in a slightly different form which shows you that indeed it is posit a positive operator because it's just an operator time its conjugate. And in fact, if this is zero, then also the 
each of them is zero. So if you require this, this implies this equation, which is just this because uh, the orthogonal projector is one minus the projector. So what this means is, is this. However, uh, it is also true because the channel, remember that the dual channel is, uh, preserves the identity. So if we apply, so if P is conserved, then the P pair P is conserved too. And from this we deduce uh, this other relation. Therefore we see that P and EI commute. Um, and so a project of P is conserved by the dual channel if and only if it commutes with every cross tri operators. Uh, here I only prove the necessity of the condition. The sufficiency is, is almost obvious because if P commutes with the channel elements, then it goes outside. What's left inside is the identity and the channel is unital, so we get P back. So now let's consider a more general observable. So a more general observable always has a, um, a spectral decomposition. So alpha k are the uh, eigenvalues and pk are projects on the eigenspaces. So if we naively ask that we want the observable to be preserved in that way, this is not quite sufficient because what this means is just that the expectation value of the observable is preserved. But there is much more to an observable than just its expectation value. What we want to preserve are the statistics of uh, the observable. So we want to preserve each probability. So we want to, pre to preserve each projector, each eigen projector. And this is, this is similar to saying that we want to preserve all the moments of the obs observable. So that's what we will say, that's what we mean when we say that A is conserved by this evolution. Now we already solved this uh, problem. It means that each of the PK commutes with all the cross operators. But if that's true, then also A commutes with a cross operator. And in fact, it's sufficient to have A commute with the cross operators because you can obtain every project of P as an, as a, you know, in terms of a polynomial in A. So we have that um, an observable A is conserved if and only if it commutes with all the cross operators. Now, if you want to look at a set of all observables which are conserved, uh, it, is, it's, it spans a, and it spans a set of all uh, operators which commute with all the cross operators. And, and this is an algebra because if two operators commute with a set of operators, then their product commutes too. And uh, these observables are all self-adjoint. Therefore, the algebra that it generates is um, it's a dagger algebra, it is closed under Hermitian conjugation. So that's one of the algebras that uh, we heard about before. So in the, in the picture that Lorenzo Viola presented, it was this algebra will be the commutant to the interaction algebra. Uh, this is in fact very close to, to, the, to the idea in the original paper on the subsystem by uh, Neil Laflam and Lorenzo Viola. Uh, except that they didn't have this interpretation in terms of them being, uh, in terms of the algebra representing observables. And that explains the direct link between um, the algebra and, and the idea of noise subsystem. So that's how the algebra appears if you want conservation of observables, but we can go further. We can ask for observables to be um, correctable. So. It's just the same thing, except that we just we don't want P to be con cons conserved by E, but we want to uh, to postulate the existence of a channel, a correction channel R, such that when composed with E, it does preserve P. So that will mean that P is correctable for the channel E if R exists, and of course R, uh, R has to be a channel. So we know that this implies that P must commute with. Uh, so if R K are the channel, the elements of the channel R then the element of this composition are all the product of the element of R and the element of E. So we know that this is will be true if and only if uh, P commutes with these guys. And I pretend that, in fact, this is equivalent to saying that P commutes uh, with all the possible products of the cross operators of E only. So this is a good condition because we don't need to know in advance the correction channel. So why is that true? Uh, it's easy to see. 
So I, I wrote, I write P, E, I, dagger, E, J. What I want to do is to move P on the other side. So I insert an identity, which is the image of the identity under the correction channel. And uh, now I take my P on the left, and we know that P will commute with these guys. Well, this guy is a emission conjugate of this, so he does commit with it too because P is self adjoint And he's also commit again. And so it's back on the left and we can remove the identity. So that's very easy. And uh, in fact, this condition is sufficient for the correctability of P. I, won't, I will not show this here, but it just amounts to building the, the usual QSC channel and uh, getting, well, it's slightly more general, but it's the same, same construction technique. So what we have here is that we, we have characterized a set of all correctable observables. Uh, they span this algebra, the algebra of all the operators which commute with all those product of cost operators. Now there are two important points to note for this to be useful uh, for quantum error correction is that First of all, we, I didn't require here that uh, each of these observ observable is correctable with the same channel. But in fact, it's true. So everybody in there are correctable with a unique correction channel. And there's one more point which is very important, is that, in fact, if it make a new channel with a coefficients, with operators, a linear combination of this EJ, then the same correction channel will still work. So that's why we can treat those errors as discrete errors in this picture too. All right, uh, so that's, that's how the, the algebra come about from this, this picture. Um, now, uh, what, does it mean, what does it mean physically to have an algebra? So the, the physical meaning of the algebra comes from the, the, um, um, the structure theory of these algebras. So I will not have time to, uh, to prove it here, but I will explain how it looks like. So each of these algebra are um, a direct sum of full matrix algebra. So what this means is that all elements in the algebra are block diagonal. So that would be a typical element where those A, B, C are matrices of different sizes. And if you replace A, B, and C by anything you want, you form an algebra, which a dagger algebra, which um, and if you change the, the size of those blocks and, and the number of those blocks, you get all possible, um, all, all possible shape of algebra you can have. So I just introduced this notation. I, I'll just write this as direct sum. So that, that defines this notation. Now that's one way to, uh, to look at this um, at a particular algebra, but in general it can live inside a larger, larger matrices. So that will be the same algebra, but inside the larger matrix, you can, you can uh, have um, redundancies. So some blocks can be repeated. Now you can write this in a different way. You can write it, this in this way because if you repeat two blocks, it's just like it's just this matrix A A on the diagonal line is just A tensor the identity for two by two, well the two by two two by two identity matrix. Same for the three Bs here. So. What we see is that the structure of any algebra defines a way to, to divide the Hilbert space in which it, it acts in terms of subsystems, uh, sub sub, um, spaces. So each block corresponds to a given subspace, and inst inside each subspace there is one subsystem on which the algebra acts trivially, and one on which it doesn't act trivially at all. So we got the structure, uh, this decomposition, directly from the structure theory of the algebra. So now what, do the, what is the physical meaning of these algebras? So we know that full, a full matrix algebra represents pure quantum information. So that's what we are used to. And we know also that if the algebra is commutative or it's just made of diagonal matrices, then this is, this is classical information. So what about something in between? Say that we have two blocks. So we have a two by two block and a four by four block. Then. This clearly means that we have one bit, so the bit which tells us in what, in what, in which subspace we are. It is a bit and not a qubit because there can be no superposition. That's what is meant by the fact that the off-diagonal element of the matrices are zero. 
there can be no separation between the two subspaces. So the information coding in which subspace we are is a classical bit. But we have more than that. But what we have on top of it depends on the value of that bit. If the bit points to the first subspace, uh, then we also have a qubit, one qubit, because we have a two by two full matrix algebra. And if the bit points to the second subspace, then we have two qubits, because we, we have this four by four uh, matrix algebra. So what this algebra represents is, um, is an amount of quantum information which is conditional on, on classical information. Uh, so this is called the hybrid information by uh, Greg Kupperberg. Uh, it's also known in, in physics as a quantum system with super selection rules. All right. So let me just um, show how this um, theory compares to uh, quantum error correction and operator quantum error correction. So we get back standard quantum error correction simply by forcing the algebra to be a full matrix algebra acting on the code. So by B of HC, I mean the set of all operators acting on the subspace HC, which is a code. If uh, we are not that restrictive and, and allow for the algebra to have a, a trivial part, then we get back a subsystem quantum error correction or operator quantum error correction. But now we have no restriction, so we are allowed to have uh, any possible structure that the algebra can take. Um, so how does this compare to the previous ones? It is clear that each of these, uh, these uh, sub-algebras uh, correspond, define a certain operator quantum error, uh, subsystem code. Uh, except that no, the theorem tells us when we can correct them all together at once with the same correction channel. Um, I don't know if I have time for an example. Two minutes, I will try. Um, so, I want to consider teleportation, um, but there will be some errors in the communication channel. So, we are near Hollywood, so we know what, what happens in movies, but in the quantum case, so this is, um, this is a standard uh, scheme for a teleportation. So here we have Alice and Bob. So Alice, uh, well, there is an entangled pair which is prepared here. One part is given to Alice, one part to Bob. Alice performs a measurement on, on her, um, her qubit. She gets some classical information which she gives to Bob, and Bob uses it to interact and to get back the qubit that Alice had. So I want to, view this, to look at this from the point of view of quantum error correction. So I will say this, is, this preparation is uh, the channel and both the classical and the quantum bit that comes uh, out of this channel is given to Bob, and Bob wants to recover the information that Alice had. So he must perform some correction operation. And uh, in that case, we can correct um, the whole of Alice's space, and that's the solution, the correction channel. And uh, the form of this, of this channel is this. So this, this, um, these are the, represent the classical information, the orthogonal, uh, orthogonal states. And these correspond to, uh, well, if it's just one qubit, then uh, this UI will be uh, the poly, poly operators. So now I want to introduce some noise in the classical communication channel, which I introduced inside E. And so the noise is represented by a stochastic matrix PIJ, which come here. Uh, so the channel elements here are of this form. And so to apply um, this theory, I want to, uh, to build this product of, um, of channel elements, because remember that this is what, what our observables, correctable observables did to commute with. And they have this form. Now, if these terms are zero, then we don't have to worry about this, uh, these operators, because, um, well, we don't have to worry about those which are non-zero, because we have to commute with all of them. Um, so this would be zero if, this would be non-zero if both those project, uh, those elements of the stochastic matrix are non-zero. And if they are both non-zero, what it means? It means that um, in that case, we will confuse the, inform the classical information corresponding to J or, or state L. So if, if you confuse J and L, that is, if, J and, and this, if this classical information cannot be distinguished anymore, then uh, our concept of variables have to commute with the corresponding group element. So just a very simple example. It's just one qubit. These are the group elements. 
So suppose that we, we, we confuse uh, sigma x, we confuse x and the identity. <laughs> then in this case, uh, all the observable must commute with this product, which is just sigma x. And so um, the algebra that we can correct is uh, the one generated by sigma x itself, because that's the only algebra which commutes with uh, sigma x. So this means that we can recover only, Bob can only recover a classical bit on Alice, about Alice's system. Um, so that's a case where, at first, we didn't know whether we could recover some quantum bit or classical bits, and we see that the theory tells us that we can, if we can, in that case, only recover one classical bit, and these bits correspond to what uh, a measurement of sigma x and Alice uh, qubit will give. So I want to do this and some reading, and thank you for your attention.